Welcome back. We're on chapter three today, and this is Russ Siegenberg, and we're glad you could join us. We we'll talk about principle number three, changing desires, and that principle states, true success and in recovery involves changing the desires of the heart. This can be accomplished through three means. One, obtaining the purifying influence of the Holy Ghost. Two, educating the inner self by cultivating truth and thoughts. Three, becoming converted to a spiritual lifestyle through faith-generated positive experiences. Understanding these processes can increase our capacity to live by correct principles in all areas of life. Psalms 51 verses 6 and 10 says, Behold, thou desireth the truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. We're going to talk about what that word heart might mean. And I think it's really interesting and really powerful in helping us change our lives. Very important in, uh, in the addiction recovery process. Three, two, one. So knowledge is power. True success in recovery comes when the addict no longer has to struggle with the desire to sin. A lot of people say that's impossible and, and think they always uh, will have to struggle. And this program does not believe that. We believe we can change the heart to the point where we don't have desires for evil. And that's certainly a part of the gospel, isn't it? Uh, with the help of the Lord, we can overcome our desires for evil. So the next 12 steps program introduces several important concepts to make this goal of changing desires possible. First of all, we want to recognize some things about the human personality. Plato said that each person is a charioteer with two horses. The black horse is passion and the white horse is reason. Then in James 1.8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So do we have two parts to our personality? I think we can see that pretty clearly when we start to look uh, in a more thoughtful way. We probably notice how difficult it is for people to change certain habits. Sometimes we notice that people aren't too nice. They lose their temper. Or they say the wrong things, right? We can go overboard with bad habits like shopping or eating. Uh, it can be hard to follow through on goals. Do, does anyone listening ever procrastinate? And of course, we let ourselves get stressed out. Now, in all these behaviors I mentioned, one could tell their friend that they should change those. And we ourselves might admit, yeah, I should change that. but. We know how hard it is to change some of these habits. And it's really important to understand the mechanism of how these habits both are developed and the purpose for them and how we can overcome them. So one of the questions about this is, do we have free will or not? That is because if we had free will, we could just choose not to eat so much ice cream and we would stop doing it. We could just choose to do our homework every day, right at the same time and work for four hours straight. So let me read a quote about uh, free will and the debate about it. This is by a person named Saul Smilansky, who is a philosopher from the University of Haifa in Haifa, Israel. He said, human beings have been aware of the free will problem for at least 2,000 years. It is thus easy to understand why this problem has a reputation of being the quintessential perennial question, one on which nothing new can be said, no progress can be made, nor any agreement reached. So Mr. Smilansky is a little pessimistic about this thing we're embarking on. And that most of how you feel and how you act and how you behave and what you believe to be true, all this stuff is being generated by systems under the hood that you have no access to and very little acquaintance with even. That's the situation. And when we look at, um, when we look at things like what you're attracted to and, and how you feel about other people and the kind of personality you have and the kind of decision making you do and hundreds of things like this, what seems clear is that if free will exists, it is a small player in the system. Well, if you consider the brain though, uh, and, and neuroscience has advanced certainly uh, because we can do brain uh, image scanning now. We've learned more than we did, although there's still a whole big frontier out there. But we know that the reasoning part of our brain is the prefrontal cortex. And it's the conscious part, the part we're most aware of. We also have uh, other parts of the brain, uh, and especially we want to consider the limbic system, which is more the center of the brain. And that we know that has to do uh, more with uh, impulses and and, and the way we experience life and desires. Neuroscience 
has, has wondered for some time, as have philosophers, about whether we have this free will or not. There's a person named Benjamin Libay who in 1983 received the Virtual Nobel Prize for some of his work in psychology. Now it's called the Virtual Nobel Prize because when Dr. Nobel was given out, first started giving out prizes, there was no psychology. So there's a university in Germany that gives out these prizes. So Libay was able to prove pretty much that the subconscious thinks. Some other people replicated his studies later on, C.S. Soon in 2008 and J. Dylan Haynes in 2008 also. So basically they found that uh, they could predict answers to simple choices seven seconds in advance before the person consciously knew what they're going to choose. They were able to predict the ultimate response about 60% of the time, so greater than chance. And this was big news. It showed that it wasn't all the thinking in the brain wasn't conscious uh, because they could detect those subconscious uh, brain patterns. What they found is we have these two systems. We have a logical system that we're really well aware of, that we plan things, we get organized, and we choose behaviors. But then we have this emotional system. The emotional system is called System 1, and the logical system, System 2. The emotional system is more involved with emotions, desires, impulsive behavior, creative thinking, and automatic patterns. That's been pretty important, right? Automatic patterns and wisdom. So when we drive a car, or if someone's interested in a sport like golf or gymnastics, if you practice enough, you can do things pretty much without thinking. That means it's gotten cemented there in, into this emotional system. So it's really interesting that the gospel and neuroscience are kind of together on this, that there's this dual systems mind. So the Lord breaks the uh, mind into these two parts of, he calls it mind, which I think refers to more the logical part of our brain, and then heart, which is more of our feeling part. Great book on, on uh, neuroscience by David Eagleman. He's a neuroscientist at Baylor University. He's also done some things on television, on PBS, about the brain. And he's pretty, that's one of the things he emphasizes the most is this dual systems mind. There's another book called The Happiness Hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. He's a psychologist. So when we begin to understand that the emotional system of the brain, or according to the scriptures, the heart runs things, and the rational system is sort of watching and trying to intervene, but not always successfully. Neuroscientists like to joke that the main function of the logical mind is to make excuses for the emotional system. The emotional system is much more powerful and very persistent in seeking its desires. If we look honestly at ourselves, we can recognize some of the things that are hard for us to do consistently, such as housework, eating right, exercise, or homework. As we notice our real desires, we are starting to get in touch with the emotional system. And it's very persistent in seeking its way. And certainly an addict becomes aware of the emotional system because it's the emotional system, the heart, that wants to act out. And it doesn't do a lot of thinking about it. In fact, it doesn't want to think about it. And that's one of the reasons that when people act out, if they're asked, why did you do that? They'll say, I don't know. What were you thinking? Nothing, because the emotional system was intent on getting what it wanted. So part of the cure is to get the rational system to work more with the emotional system to make uh, make it more of a conscious process. We want to talk about the heart. Um, there's over 500 scriptures about the heart. But I'll just read just a few. Proverbs 29: Who can say I have made my heart clean? I am pure from sin. Proverbs 23:7: For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Matthew 6, verse 21, For where your treasure is, there your heart be also. So that's from the Sermon on the Mount. The Savior said that, so he had a sense of this change in heart, and he called it our treasure. And I really think it's the reason we're here is to change our heart. Matthew 12, 35 says, A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Then Jeremiah 17.9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So those two scriptures illustrate an important concept that the heart's not totally good. Sometimes people believe that their spirit's totally good and that their body sins somehow. But 
According to the scriptures, that's not true. We, we, we develop evil desires as we experience life, as we experience temptation, as we listen to Satan. An example that spirits might not be totally good is Satan and his angels. You know, one third of the hosts of heaven uh, were disobedient and, and they're certainly not all good. The idea is that we can have both good and bad in our heart. And of course, we want to refine ourselves and develop uh, more righteousness. Some of the prophets have talked about this. President McKay said the highest purpose of man is to develop the spirit within him. President Brigham Young said the spirit is the intelligent part of man and is intimately connected with the tabernacle. And then President McKay said something that was really brilliant and I, and I think enlightening and, and it makes you think. He said the spirit in man controls this physical body just as the driver of an auto may control that machine. Thus the spirit of man works through the in my mind, through the emotional, logical systems of the brain. So it kind of fits in with what Brigham Young said, where the spirit's intelligent and it's just using the brain like a computer. So we talked about the idea that the thoughts and feelings of the heart can be very different than that of the logical mind. We're told James 4 8 to, says, Purify your hearts, ye double minded. Uh, then in uh, Doctrine and Covenants 8, 2, it says, Yea, behold, I'll tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost, which will come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. So one of the ways to look at this is I should versus I want. So when we just say I should do this, I should read my scriptures, I should help my neighbor out. That usually is a conscious process versus I want. Like I want to go to the beach. I want to go out to eat. The things we want to do, we just do without anyone trying to persuade us. The things we should do are implicitly more difficult and we have to gear ourselves up to get ourselves to do that, to get the heart to cooperate. So a big part of recovery is getting the heart to cooperate. One of the other reasons people get addicted is that they get conditioned over time to manage their emotions through the addictive behavior. And the heart's involved in this because the heart, or the emotional system, is the part of that gets upset. One of the signs is that we can be upset about something and not even know why. And that's very, very common and very, very common with addicts that they'll be upset and not know specifically why. So part of this process is going to be to learn how to manage our emotions and feelings and sort through them so we can move on and not be continue to be distressed about things. A lot of times people don't know how to do that, but we will teach you lots of concepts about how to do that. One other sign of inner conflict is avoiding doing the right thing or falling through on responsibilities. So someone that's maybe not passing college because they can't get themselves to go to class or do the homework. We also can give in to impulses that we know are self-defeating or hurtful to others. And, and we sometimes afterwards will say, oh, why did I say that? Well, why did I do that? And, and it shows how the heart's not acting the way we want in our conscious mind. Now the heart's very clever, and so it will actually get us to lie to ourselves or make excuses to justify bad behavior. So when people feel like acting out, they'll usually come up with a set of lies to excuse the behaviors that are going to precipitate the acting out. So part of the cure is to catch yourself telling yourself these, uh, these lies, this self-deception. Oh, we got a beautiful crowd. Yeah, but we got a couple funny-looking people in here. No, no, that, that's not nice. Huh? You owe them an apology. What? Tell them you're sorry. Okay. Go ahead. And you're sorry, too. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them you're sorry for calling them funny-looking. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry that you're funny-looking. <laughs> So the secret of change, which I've alluded to some of this, is we can communicate with the emotional mind, the heart. It actually wants the conscious mind to provide direction. So in a sense, we want to teach the gospel to ourselves. The emotional system will provide information, feedback to the conscious mind about how it's feeling, what it wants, and the conscious mind can provide analysis and direction in return. So for instance, if someone felt like acting out, the conscious mind could say, now we're, we've, we've really made a firm decision not to do that. And what's the need? Why do you want to do this? And as we pay attention to the emotional self, which talks in feelings, not in words, we might realize that maybe we're bored. And so the conscious mind could say, hey, 
if we're bored, let's uh, do something constructive. Read that good book we've been enjoying or go visit one of our friends. And so we find other ways to meet those needs. Or if we're upset or perhaps we're angry or stressed out, we want to sit down and think about it, use some of the tools you'll be learning to sort those feelings out and get back to feeling uh, calm and peaceful. Well, these have been important concepts. I hope you'll continue to have an interest to learn about them and learn how to manage the heart and change your desires. Thank you for joining us today. And we're going to be going to part B. We're going to talk in the next video some of the tricks to and, and some of the tools to use to start changing the, and educating the heart.